Hey, it's Grady at Twin Creek Audio. And today I want to talk about some of the details and challenges that may present themselves when you're mixing hybrid style using an audio interface and a console to combine different tracks in the analog world instead of the digital world. In my case, I'm using standard audio interfaces. I don't have anything new and fancy like the Cranborn 500 series rack where I can use analog inserts inside my DAW. I just have standard audio interfaces with the outputs of the audio interfaces connected to inputs on my console back here. And keep in mind that I'm only talking about outputs and mixing in this particular video. I did make a video on recording tracks with an analog console. I'll put a link to that video as well as the other videos I've made about hybrid mixing that go into more of the physical setup details. I'll put those links in the video description and at the end of this video. But for this video, we're talking basically about outputs only. So you've got your outputs from your audio interfaces connected to separate either line inputs or tape inputs on some type of a mixing console. I'm going to show you a couple of things in the box that might trip you up and then talk about a few things on the analog console itself that are also either useful or possibly tricky. I'm going to go over the in the box part of some of the challenges that you might face when you're trying to mix from your DAW through a console. So we're looking at Reaper here, and this is the House of the White Tie Imperial theme that I'm using. And you can see over here that Reaper has automatically added a stereo pair of outputs, or, you know, a stereo output. So it's a pair of mono outputs over here on the master. Uh, we're probably not going to need those except in special cases. I'll leave that there for now, though. We'll come over here where I've got different tracks here in Reaper. I'm going to start with a kick track. I'm going to click the route button, and then I want to uncheck this master send right here so that this track is no longer going over here to this master bus. So then I want to assign it a new output. It's a mono track, so I just want a single mono output, so I'm going to assign it to the first output on the first of my two interfaces. Then click the route button on the snare track, do the same thing, uncheck master send, and select an individual mono output to send that snare track to. Now when I get to the hi-hat track, sometimes I like to combine this with the overheads and just send all three of those to a single pair of mono outputs so I have a stereo left and right mix of my overhead and my hi-hat. So I'll do that in Reaper. I can just uncheck Master Sin and go ahead and select the stereo output that I want to use. In this case, I'll use five and six on the first interface. I also want to send the overheads to that. So I'm going to click the route button on both of the overheads. And in this case, I don't really even have to select it there. I just want to go ahead and uncheck Master Sin and then I can just drag this over there we go. So now we have our hi-hat and stereo left and right overhead mics all being sent to a single pair of mono outputs to make a stereo, a stereo output for the overhead and hi-hat combination. You can do the same thing with the toms. Just have to remember to uncheck master send on all three of those tracks. I'm going to go ahead and do that all at the same time. Then go here to add the hardware output, in this case I want to use 3, 4 on my first interface. So then we'll just drag that over to copy it. And now I have kick going to mono output number 1 on the first interface, snare going to mono output number 2 on the first interface. I have hi-hat and overheads grouped to 5 and 6 on the first audio interface and toms grouped and sent to three and four. So that means that I can blend my hi-hat and my overheads here in the box and I can do the same thing with the tom. Say my floor tom's not quite as loud as I want it to be so I can still adjust the individual instruments here in the box even though I'm sending this just to a pair of channels on the console from two audio outputs on the audio interface. The room mic, it's a mono thing, so we can send that to a, a different one in this case. We're, we're up to seven now, so let's send this room mic out to another mono output. So we've got that going to a separate output, and we can do the same thing with bass.
and do the same thing with the guitar. When we come to keys, that's a stereo track. So we'll send it to a pair of outputs. In this case, we'll use, I guess, 11 and 12, because I think this was 10, right? Did I get that right? Yes, I did. Okay, so now I have all of that. Now, if I remembered to uncheck the master send on all of these, there will be no signal here to come out of these other outputs on the audio interface. But to be on the safe side, I'm gonna go ahead and delete that. So I have no output assigned here on the master and each of these individual tracks are assigned to mono or stereo outputs on the audio interface that are then connected to the console. The challenge here being if you forget to uncheck master send and then say you're using the same pair over here as assigned as one of these, then you've got all of these things coming out what's supposed to be just your overheads and that can get confusing sometimes. So make sure that you're not sending multiple things to outputs on your audio interface that you don't mean to. The other big thing to remember in here is say I wanted to put a plug-in on here. I'm going to use like a tape plug-in because I really like the soft tube tape plug-in. So if I've got a tape plug-in on the kick drum track and I don't really have to set this because it's just a demonstration but that's how I'd probably set it for a kick. So if I've got something like a plug-in on the insert of my DAW track here, I need to remember that this plug-in is coming before the console because the analog console has inserts. And yes, I know there are some newer audio interfaces and things like the Cranborn 500 series rack where you can actually use external inserts, but we're not talking about that here. We're talking about just using a standard interface and using the outputs on the interface to connect to a console. Or in a case like this, you have to remember that whatever plugin is here on this track is coming before the console itself. So whatever processing is happening here is happening first before it hits the console or the inserts on the console or anything like that. So this is basically like pre-processing the way that we're using it. We're just using a standard audio interface to feed the inputs of an analog console, which is also why I have most of these set to zero unless I need to blend things like my toms. If I need to adjust the blend on everything, then I can do that in here. It's really not gonna hurt anything. Ideally though, so that you've got better recall, you wanna set all your faders to zero and then adjust those on the console. Another thing I want to talk about while I'm in here is using effects in the box and then returning those to the console somehow. So in Reaper, you just create another track because a track is a bus, a bus is a track in Reaper. So we're just going to call this, we'll call that verb. And we just want to throw some kind of a reverb plug in on here. We'll put the Slate Verb Suite Classics here on this bus basically even though in reaper obviously a track and a bus are kind of the same thing a track can become a bus depending on how you're using it which is one of the really cool things about reaper is it's so flexible so we don't doesn't even matter what reverb so now we have reverb here on this track i'm still going to uncheck this master send and i want to give this reverb an output i want to send this to a pair of outputs since it's a stereo reverb so i'm just going to select a pair of outputs on my audio interface that I can use. I can use the first pair of outputs on my second interface because I haven't used it already. So the reverb now is going out to a pair of outputs on my audio interface and then it will come into channels on the console. So I can actually blend it with the other analog or hybrid elements of the mix that way. However, I can't use the auxiliary sends on the console to send to this reverb because it's in the box. Well, I guess I could, but that would be pretty convoluted. So the easier way to do that is just create a send, like say snare, and we'll send this over here. And now you've got a send on the snare track that's being sent to this reverb. So your send, your auxiliary send is here in the box, but then you're returning the reverb to a separate set of interface outputs that you're connecting to your console. So in this case, your reverb return would be on faders on your analog console and your reverb send would be here in the box. In Reaper, when I assign multiple tracks to the same pair of audio outputs on the interface, I can pan across those outputs right here. And it basically acts like a virtual bus. 
However, I can also actually make a bus. In Reaper, anything can be a bus. I want to make sure to uncheck that. In Reaper, anything can be a bus. The track can be a bus. So, you know, a, a track can be a bus or it can be a track. But in other DAWs, you may have to create a bus for this. But in Reaper, that's the alternative. We, we just create another track. We'll call it Tom's. Call that Tom's. And so instead of sending directly to the audio interface outputs like this, we can send these three to this bus that we call Tom's. And then we can assign the output to that same pair that we had before. So now instead of these three tracks going to the pair of the audio outputs directly, they're going to this track or bus and then to the same pair of outputs. I guess that gives you a little bit more control. I usually just assign these tracks to the pair of outputs that I want and don't worry about it, but this does give you additional control to raise and lower the level of the toms in your DAW. On the console, we've got a couple of different ways to process analog audio. You've got inserts on the channel, which only affect what's on that individual channel. And then you've got auxiliary sends. Auxiliary sends can be thought of as taking a split from whatever's on that channel and sending that somewhere else to be used. The insert is straight in line and only affects the single channel that it's on. So it's taking its input from the channel and then the output of the insert or whatever device is plugged into that insert is coming back into the channel strip. An auxiliary send can be thought of as taking a split of the sound that's on that channel and sending it somewhere else to be processed. An auxiliary send does not have a built-in return. So whatever you send from the auxiliary send will use aux3 as an example. So the AUX3 over there on my patch bay is connected to the left input of the Yamaha Rev 500 rack reverb. And then the return of the Yamaha Rev 500 has to go somewhere else so it can be blended in with the mix. In this case, I've got it connected to a stereo channel down here. Hopefully you can still see that blue fader on the channel. So the auxiliary send is sending, in this case, the snare out to the reverb using the aux synth, which can be pre or post. I'll explain more about that in a second. And then it's going out to the reverb unit and it's coming back through a stereo channel. So the stereo reverb return is connected to this stereo channel down here. Pre or post fader. The thing that's really important about that is if you want independence. If you want the level of the auxiliary send to be independent of your fader, you would want a pre fader send. Some auxiliary sends are switchable between pre and post fader sends. Others are fixed either pre or post fader. Generally, a pre fader auxiliary send is good for when you want independence because a pre fader send is not affected by the level of the fader down here. So a pre fader send is useful for something like a headphone mix where once you get it adjusted for the musician, it's not going to change if you change the control room mix. Post fader aux sends are better for effects because the effect also disappears when you pull the instrument out. Of course, you can break the rules all you want. You can use a pre fader aux send on a reverb and when you take the dry signal out, you have this ghost reverb there. You know, there are tricks you can do with that, but in general, pre fader aux sends for things that you need independence for, like headphone mixes and post fader aux sends for effects. Subgroups in the analog world can be used several different ways. You can send your channels to a subgroup or a pair of subgroups and then send those subgroups to the master bus. However, you can also send a channel to a subgroup and the master bus simultaneously. And in those cases, you can put something on the subgroup insert if your console has inserts on the subgroups and you can do things like parallel compression or blend other effects with the dry signal. Subgroups can also be useful for just making mixing easier by assigning a bunch of things to a pair of subgroups so you can control all of your drums with two subgroups. I don't normally do a lot of that when I'm mixing hybrid because I can subgroup things in the box and then send those things out to a pair of channels so I don't have to use analog subgroups. That way I'm not adding another layer of analog circuitry to the sound 
unless I just want more analog color and then you could route things through a subgroup and then through the master bus so it'd be coming in the channel then through the subgroup and then to the master bus so like two different gain stages on the way to the master bus instead of just one it's kind of difficult for me to show you how to subgroup things on this console although it will do it this console is set up to be like a floating subgroup floating bus architecture so it's a little bit hard to visualize on this console but I have made some other videos with the Soundtracks Topaz, which is a much more standard 8-bus mixer. So you might refer to some of those videos for a little bit more detail on subgroups on analog consoles. I'll put a link to that in the video description along with the other hybrid mixing videos and the tracking using an analog console since we're not covering any of the recording side today in this video. It's just mixing. There are a lot of cool things you can do on the analog console. You just need to remember your signal flow. In other words, which audio interface output is this channel connected to? So I have an audio interface output from the DAW that's coming into this channel. The way I have mine set up, it's nine on the first interface. So I just have it really one to one or nine to nine in this case, so that it's easy for me to find where my audio outputs from my interface are coming up on the console. Just in case you're curious, on my console, the Soundcraft Sapphire, these small faders up here, these are actually the channel faders. These would be used to send two tape. So these are like for recording and these are the monitor faders. So they're more for mixing, but they can be reversed. So this console will do a lot of cool analog tricks, including using the XFX buttons to have a post fader aug send that's actually variable. And I can send that to pairs of buses. But that's what these are. These are the channel faders. Normally these are being used for the microphones to be sent to tape. And these monitor faders down here are what's coming back from tape, or in this case, audio interfaces. If you come from the analog world and you started out on analog tape or even ADATs and using analog consoles, this stuff should be pretty simple for you. If you're not used to that, definitely read the manual for your particular console and learn as much as you can about analog signal flow. Those things will help a lot if you're trying to mix in a hybrid fashion. Overall, I really enjoy mixing in the hybrid fashion like I've done in many videos here on the channel and like I've done for a lot of music that I've mixed and has been released commercially. Hybrid mixing workflow works really well for me. I don't find that recall of this type of mix is that difficult anymore, especially since everybody has a camera in their pocket take pictures of the settings on your console and your outboard rack gear that you're using in the mix. That way you can recall it more easily later should you need to. I really enjoy hybrid mixing and I enjoy making videos about hybrid mixing for all of you out there. So make sure to like this video and subscribe to the Twin Creek Audio YouTube channel if you have not done so already as well as checking out all the various links in the description for other videos that I've made that relate to this video and other links that go to help support this channel, such as music or things that I've produced or been a part of, etc., etc. I hope each and every one of you out there has an excellent and wonderful day, night, evening, weekend, weekday, hour, minute, second, nanosecond, whatever it is you're having, have a good one. Thanks for watching. <laughs>